uh, Mr. Arunachalam and uh, other distinguished guests. Now, let me first confess, you know, you spend enough time outside academia, they strip you of your title. So I'm no longer the Eric J. Gleacher Distinguished Service Professor. Uh, as uh, administrators here would know, titles are expensive. And uh, <laughs> once somebody doesn't have it, you pass it on to the next guy who needs it. So, so I'm, uh, but um, reason uh, for this particular choice of topic is, uh, uh, you know, I've been uh, speaking a fair amount about uh, monetary policy across the world and, and uh, worrying about sustainability. And I thought I'd spoken enough about it and uh, perhaps I should move on to something new. And uh, like all academics, uh, you know, uh, six months before the event, you sort of give a title and hope by that time you'll have thought enough about it to actually <laughs> <laughs> give a, a reasonable talk. Uh, and um, certainly I gave this uh, some time back, uh, but let me see if I've um, got a coherent um, talk together. I mean, the, the reason for why I think this is extremely important is uh, again and again, you find that revolutions are associated with, with really two things, uh, excess debt and uh, inappropriate land holdings. Those are the two things which, uh, which often prompt revolutions. And uh, we've seen sort of mini uh, turbulences across the world associated with the global financial crisis. Uh, you know, we've had people protesting about capitalism, uh, not, not to a great extent. I mean, certainly far less than one would expect given the magnitude of the crisis. But it may be that we haven't seen everything yet and there is more to come. But again and again, some of the concerns have to do with, with debt and the purveyors of debt, right? And this is not something new. I think his, uh, right from early history, uh, the usurer has been seen as a, a figure in society who has, uh, who has uh, been blamed for much ill. Um, you know, in the, in the 12th, 13th century, uh, massive campaigns uh, by the church in, um, in Europe uh, talking about the evils of usury and how to um, how to deal with the usurer, um, you know uh, the the Pope issued instructions then that uh, all known usurers should be excommunicated. They are not allowed to receive the sacrament, and under no conditions could their bodies be buried in hallowed ground. So uh, that's the worst possible uh, punishment because it's punishment in afterlife, and and one of the biggest uh, concerns in uh, in uh, in, um, um, in Europe at that time was, yeah, what would happen to your soul? You spent only 15, 18, 20 years on earth, but what happened to your soul was extremely important, and, and there you were consigned. Um, um, one story which uh, David uh, Grebner, in, uh, David Grebner has a very interesting book, if you haven't, Greber, if you haven't read it, uh, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, very interesting. It's a little bit of a polemic uh, and, uh, um, you know, but, but nevertheless, uh, thick and interesting. He writes about this French cardinal uh, talking about a particularly influential money lender whose friends tried to persuade the parish priest to overlook the rules and allow him to be buried in the churchyard. So um, since the friends of the usurer were, were very insistent, the priest yielded to pressure and said, okay, let me offer a solution. Let's put his body on a donkey and see God's will and see what he'll do with the body. Where the donkey takes it, be it a church or a cemetery or elsewhere, there I will bury it. And then they placed the body on the donkey and followed it. And without deviating right or left, it went straight out of town to the place where thieves were hanged. And <laughs> right there it stopped and sent the body flying into the dung below the, uh, the gallows. The point of this story is, is really to, again, make the point that, you know, uh, lenders weren't particularly respectable, right? Um, before the financial crisis, uh, we thought things had changed. After the financial crisis, uh, when you look at the opprobrium that bankers today have, uh, things haven't changed that much. That the bankers, uh, society has very ambivalent views 
uh, lionizing them at some times. I mean, uh, to find in India, to find a banker as a bridegroom uh, was extremely important a few years ago because that was an assured job, uh, strong returns, especially if you were in the United States and in one of the uh, wonderful investment banks. Today, not so, not so, not so highly thought of. Uh, actually, in India, you follow the prices for bridegrooms and the dowries. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a quite effective way of mapping status in society. So it's come down somewhat. Um, so why w what's going on? And uh, of course, more seriously, we've had an enormous amount of regulation being placed on banks. Uh, I'm part of the Basel discussions that take place every, every two months. And uh, there's been an enormous effort to try and uh, uh, rein in debt, especially short-term debt, capital requirements of one kind or the other, liquidity requirements, uh, and so on. And it, it seems to go on and on, though I hope we've, we've sort of concluded at least the first set. So is debt good or bad? And how should we think about it? And what I'm going to say in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so is sort of make somewhat obvious points, but, but try and um, bolster them. Uh, the first point is debt is like dynamite, right? It's very useful in the right places, explosive in others. And so you need to figure out where you want to use it uh, and use it appropriately. And the, the problems always come when we go to inop inappropriate places. Second, because it's so effective as a way of borrowing, especially short-term uh, secured, there's a temptation to overuse it. And this is where that temptation overlaid with warped incentives creates enormous, uh, in, in, in enormous problems if, uh, if you're not careful. Um, so handle with care and watch out for incentives is, uh, is, is the second point. Third point is there's a large movement to ban it, to say, you know, no more debt. Let's have all equity capital structures or uh, high uh, uh, capital structures with a lot of equity. And this is, uh, I think, uh, we forget it's actually a very useful instrument also. And in fact, it's at the core of capitalism in, in some sense, and I, I'll talk about that in a second, because it, it expands uh, the range of people who can borrow, the range of people who can come into the system. And we shouldn't forget that. That's, that's an extremely important aspect of ca capitalism. So with the good and the bad, the somewhat uh, uh, sort of uh, obvious answer is we need moderation and extreme care. And a lot of the moderation has to be exercised not just at the individual level or at the firm level, but at the political level. Because all too often, debt becomes an instrument of convenience at the political level, and we've seen that happen in recent years. So that's, that's sort of where I'm, I'm, I'm going broadly. But let me, let me flesh out these, these statements, and then we'll, 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 we'll chat. Uh, we'll take questions. Um, first, what are the characteristics of debt? Well, it's a pre-specified payment at a specific time enforced by law. All these things we understand. But what's important is what it replaces. Why is it so important in capitalism? What it replaces are favors, implicit agreements, relationships, things that are fuzzy. Um, you know, you borrow some tools from me. Um, maybe a few weeks down the line, I go back to you and borrow something else from you, and, and you repay the favor. That's how the community sort of works in the absence of these kinds of contractual uh, statements. Um, the problem is, with these kinds of fuzzy relationships, it keeps activity within a small circle. It's the village. I'm not going to lend to somebody who's going to go away because I have no ability to trust him, and I have no sense that he will re repay the favor. Um, also, there's a lot of mutual dependence, right? That I do a favor for you, but the repayment, in some sense, depends on whether you have the inclination, whether we are friends still, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of dependence built in. What debt does is eliminate this, this kind of mutual dependence. It's a clear obligation. You've got to pay at thus and such time. Otherwise, the full force of the law will fall on you. And you know, because often it's short-term secured, I really depend, don't depend on you. 
Uh, I don't depend on how your business is doing. When I want my money, uh, for the most part, of course, there, there is credit risk and so on. I'll come to that. But for the most part, I don't need to know too much about you. There's a uh, range of papers on this, uh, Dang, Gorton, Holmstrom. I don't need to know too much about you because, again, it's short-term secured. I don't need to know too much. I don't need us to have mutual interest. In fact, I can hate your guts and still lend to you, right? Uh, and this is Shylock, right? The old story of Shylock is uh, uh, he wasn't uh, a particularly friendly creditor, but he still made the loan. Um, now, all this is accentuated in the modern financial system uh, when debt is short-term collateralized and runnable. And a lot of debt has this characteristic, uh, basically short-term collateralized. And if there's any suspicion the borrower can't pay, people come for their money uh, and try and withdraw it very quickly. So why is this a good thing? I mean, this, again, like dynamite. And the obvious reason it's good is it offers anyone resources when in need. Uh, again, the absolute anonymity uh, embedded in debt means it expands the range of people who can come and borrow simply because it is such a strong contract. So you don't know, need to know too much about the borrower so long as you're reasonably uh, confident they have more assets than, uh, than the debt that they're borrowing. There's, a little, there's very little need for contacts. I don't need to have influence over the person. I don't need to have relationships. I don't need to know who their father and their father's father was. This is pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, also, because it's such a powerful contract, it trades easily amongst people. There's liquidity. I don't have any specific enforcement capacity over the lender, or over the borrower, which means that somebody I sell it to does not need to have that specific enforcement capacity. It's a liquid instrument, trades very easily. So the the value of debt is it expands the market for resources considerably over what the village economy had. And a second important value, and that's something that you see with long-lived institutions. Long-lived institutions are a particular characteristic of capitalism, whether it's, it's uh, corporations or whether it's governments, that long-lived institutions can borrow large sums by pledging future value. Okay? This is, uh, uh, if uh, some of you recall, this is how the Bank of England started, right? The Bank of England was a way for the government of the UK to borrow large sums. And the way it did it was by giving the Bank of England a monopoly over, over issue. But the Bank of England monetized those rents by issuing a lot of debt to the public. And that was why the government could then get the resources. In fact, there are people who argue that the reason Britain, a small island, was dominant in military affairs in the 17th, 18th, 19th century was they'd figured out how to borrow. They'd figured out how to borrow through devices like the Bank of England, and that's what allowed them to actually pay the Navy, unlike the French, who had a Navy but couldn't pay them, and therefore uh, found that they could not, they could not uh, fight as effectively. Um, these, these large sums, uh, the nature of the debt contract is different from equity because it's a promise. And therefore, it also binds future generations of managers and corporations, future generations of citizens in, 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 um, in countries. And therefore, it's a way of promising the future. And that's a way of raising many more resources today. And what that also means is, if I can monetize the future by creating the right kinds of structures, I also have a very strong incentive to think about the future. So even if I'm a short-term government, uh, I, I really want to milk my citizens. But the fact that I can raise debt against future governments and future citizens in my country means that I have an incentive. I have a longer horizon. I look to the future to make sure that uh, I, can, uh, I can create a good country, generate surpluses, which can pay uh, pay out today. So the whole point is the ability to raise resources through debt can be a very good thing, uh, both in terms of facilitating investment today, but also facilitating long horizon thinking, because people start thinking, OK, I can raise more. Can I create the right institutions to raise even more? Uh, and for that, I have to convince the markets to buy the debt. And for that, I have to put in place the appropriate institutions. Now, these are all the good things. But of course, people complain that 
you know, this is all good advertising, but there's really a serious problem with debt. First complaint, of course, it is it kills community. As soon as I know that this tool that I have, uh, rather than lend it to you, I can essentially do a repo with somebody else and, and get some interest for that, I have less incentive to be uh, part of the community, okay? Uh, put more broadly, when the community knows that it can borrow, it has less incentive to stay within the community and do favors for each other because resources are available through formal contracts outside. I don't need to do uh, favors for anybody. I don't need to lend you money in expectation to get it back. I can put the money in a deposit outside. So as soon as you formalize some of these, these, these situations with formal debt, the informal structure starts breaking down. And this is why people often say capitalism is in, cont in contrast to community. Capitalism leads to a breakdown in community because the, the kinds of contracts, formal contracts, and the fact that capitalism allows you to trade with outsiders means the inside community trade starts getting hurt and, 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 and the relationship business gets, uh, gets hurt. A second argument is, again, the uh, exact opposite of the benefit. The benefit is I don't need to have contacts, I don't need to have information, I don't need to have empathy, I can lend to you. But the flip side of it is when I get into difficulty, you don't have empathy. You are an outsider, you've lent to me, uh, and if I have difficulty, you just want your money back. And therefore, you're not willing to, uh, to stay in. I mean, an example of this is the so-called vulture funds that deal with country debt, right? The uh, famous Elliott and Company, which has been trying to buy Argentinian debt and hold them up and get them to pay. And you know the complaint is, don't you have any empathy for an emerging market which is in difficulty? Uh, you're just buying the debt and trying to squeeze this out. But the whole point of debt sometimes is, it's precisely because we don't have empathy that we have a reason, that we, we have a knowledge, we'll get it back. One of the examples you see on this is that in many communities, you'll find that the uh, money lender uh, often is from outside the community. Uh, and uh, that's because they actually don't have empathy, which is why they can uh, afford to lend and get their money. If they listen to all the sob stories, they would never actually get their money back. So the, the good side of it is they're willing to lend. The bad side of it is conditional on distress. They're not, not more sympathetic, but they're two sides of the same coin. Another uh, problem with debt, and this is, I think, uh, a, a interesting problem, certainly in the Indian context, is that it makes promising easy. And sometimes, when you're not thinking far enough, you take on too much debt. The over-indebtedness of households, the over-indebtedness of farmers. Uh, sometimes in India, this has led to debt bondage. You, you sort of promised yourself for many generations uh, to, to, the, um, to, the, um, to the lender. And I think if you look at all these, uh, these are all individually problematic, but they've got their they're the flip side of some, some, uh, uh, some of the positives of debt. Where debt really goes off track, I think one could argue are three situations. The first is a version of what I just said, which is that when in trouble, people are willing to promise anything, promise the moon, right? And that's when, if they take on debt, they could take on a huge amount of debt because the uh, person who's dealing with them at that point has enormous bargaining power. If, if I want to bail out my, uh, if I'm in a drought, I'm a farmer, and I have my kids who are going hungry, and I go to the money lender, the money lender says, well, I'll give you thus and such money, but at an enormous interest rate. At that point, I don't care, because I really want the money to feed my kids. So bargaining power in those situations may be quite extreme. One of the reasons, when you look at the history of usury, you see that usury laws became much stronger in times when the agricultural sector was in great difficulty, when agricultural holdings were small, when volatility in agricultural incomes was high, when people got into difficult situations. In order to protect them against this, the usury laws which limited interest rates that could be charged were enforced much more strongly. However, 
when uh, things were, times were better and people wanted money to invest and were willing to borrow and they got more reasonable interest rates, the usury laws came off. So one important concern, and this is a concern I face as a regulator, how much do you put constraints on interest rates? And really for the, for the most uh, depressed segments of society, there is a case, I, w I think, for putting some limits on interest rates. As academics, we typically say, no, no, don't put any limits on interest rates. Uh, but in some cases, there is to even the bargaining power in those situations. Second uh, big problem when it goes off track is when lenders don't really care because they know they'll get the money back willy-nilly. And in that case, they may add to an extreme uh, uh, to, to significant amounts of debt that the borrower has taken up. Let me give you one example in the Indian context again. Um, we have domestic laws uh, which govern bankruptcy and so on, but they take a long time to, uh, to go through. So when domestic lenders lend, they usually lend with the idea they'll work it out somehow if the borrower gets into distress. However, corporations also borrow abroad. But when they borrow abroad, they borrow under U, uh, London rules or Hong Kong rules or New York rules, in which bankruptcy can be much faster and there are some foreign assets which can be seized by the lender who comes from abroad. So when the lender comes from abroad, they know there's a whole bunch of Indian lenders who are willing to do deals and who may, if threatened with putting the firm into bankruptcy, essentially bail out the, the, the foreign lender and say, here's your money, go away, don't put this firm into bankruptcy, we'll deal with it ourselves. Well, this is a clear case of moral hazard. You go in without taking the risks because you know somebody else will bail out. Now, this is a case of private bailout. We have public bailout. That's always a situation in which get, debt gets, gets off track. We saw consequences of that during the great financial crisis. And the last uh, uh, situation where it goes off track is that in academia, we always resume that when you have too much debt, the debt is easily negotiated down. And, uh, and then everything becomes hunky-dory, that all the bad incentives associated with excess debt go away. The truth is, renegotiating debt down is very, very difficult, especially in many of the situations. Either the situation is too small, as with the US households during this debt crisis, or doing an across-the-board debt waiver is politically very difficult for a variety of reasons. So these are situations where things go off track, and we've seen examples of this in, uh, in recent times. So I want to end with, with a couple of, uh, of uh, um, sort of ways of thinking about it. Can we fix this problem, or do we have to live with it, right? So the people who want to fix this problem want to go back to boring old relationship banking. Let's go back to the old days when we had relationship banking where all these new lenders didn't come, and we didn't have the shadow banking system, we didn't have anything. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, that relationship banking is dead because competition has killed it. And today you can't go back to the old uh, relationships. Then there are people who say, well, well, okay, forget that, but what about the tax deductibility of interest? One of the reasons we have excess debt is because of the tax deductibility of interest. <laughs> That's not quite true. Uh, the tax deductibility of interest would apply whether you had long-term debt or short-term debt. Long-term debt has never really been as big a problem as short-term runnable debt. And the real problem during the crisis was there was a lot of short-term runnable debt. And there, you know, you still get interest deductibility whether you have short-term debt or long-term debt. Why do people issue the short-term stuff? Simply because it's easier getting resources doing that than issuing long-term stuff. So uh, removing the tax deductibility of interest will not solve the problem that you really want the ability to promise uh, in a very effective way, and short-term debt gives you that. And then there are you know, current attempts, certainly on the banking side, to limit leverage. We have capital requirements that we've put in place. Uh, we have country limits on borrowing being proposed in, in Europe. Uh, we have a variety of usury laws, of course, uh, including in my own country. The problem with all these efforts to limit le leverage is uh, they work when people don't want to lend. But when people want to lend, there are so many ways around them 
that they leak a lot. I mean, usury laws, uh, I limit the amount of interest that can be charged. Well, there's an upfront fee that can be charged which can substitute for interest, right? So there are ways around it. Um, similarly, with capital requirements, we assume that, you know, somebody will hold the asset side fixed as you increase capital requirements, therefore, the entity will be safer and safer. But in practice, what happens? Increased capital requirements, they look for every which way that they change the asset side to be consistent with the amount of capital they have on their balance sheet. So gaming today is not high because it's very hard at this point to, uh, to make reasonable loans. There's a lot of risk aversion in the banking system. But as we forget the, the lessons of the crisis and we move to a new environment, will the capital requirements be as effective as they seem to be today? And that's a question to ask. I'm not saying we shouldn't have them, but we should be conscious of the limits of these, these kinds of things because the underlying point is leverage is actually very attractive as a way to increase business. And if we forget that, then we're going to be too confident about these kinds of solutions. Um, uh, we already saw with limits on debt, country limits on debt, there are various, various accounting ways, various places you can hide it. Uh, so none of these are perfect solutions. I think uh, I, before I end, I want to go to um, uh, one possible solution that has been there and that, that uh, across countries, uh, when things get really terrible, when debt gets too high, uh, there has always been a political solution to debt. And that has been one of the ways the benefits of debt at the individual level, at the individual firm level can be there, while at a collective level, when it gets too much, you deal with it. And, and the, the country which is most classic in this is the United States. In the 19th century, uh, it didn't have a formal bankruptcy code, but farmers repeatedly got into trouble by overborrowing and having poor harvests, etc. So what they used to do is, every 20 years when people got into trouble, they used to bring in a bankruptcy code for a short period, which allowed the farmers to escape their debts at a collective level. And then after that period, they took it off. So lending became easier. Of course, if you had the bankruptcy code, lenders would be wary. You know, will they write down my debt uh, willy-nilly? Uh, so they kept the bankruptcy code for a few months and took it off again and let the lending pick up once again, okay? So this they did. The most famous of these waivers was what was called the gold clause in the 1930s. Uh, debt was accompanied by a clause which said the debt would be repayable in gold. A lot of debt had it, state debt, corporate debt. And what happened was the U.S. went off the gold standard. And so now repaying in gold was extremely costly relative to what it had been before. So it was like there was an enormous amount of debt which was now overhanging the country. And what the government in the United States did in the 30s, it said the gold clause no longer applies. It's null and void. And the issue went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you know, this is okay, the government has the ability to do that. So overnight, the debt went down uh, by about 30 or 40 percent of face value because it no longer had to be paid in gold. The point I'm making is even the most capitalist of countries recognizes the problems with substantial debt overhang in the country and recognizes that debt is a necessary, I don't want to say necessary evil, but a necessary contract. So perhaps the answer is, of course, moderation, which I'm going to come to. But also it is that periodically, when we are faced with this kind of thing, we have to find ways to forgive the debt in the most effective way possible. Countries that survive uh, typically tend to do this early and, and well. So bottom line, uh, I've sort of uh, basically uh, tried to argue that Debt is important, has a lot of benefits, has a lot of value, important to investment, uh, but is also the kind of instrument that is likely to create difficulties within community, try, which will create difficulty for the lender, uh, which is why you know, bankers in some communities are a figure of hatred, um, because of the nature of the debt contract. So hard to do without it, and when we do a lot of it, it's also equally hard.
So the answer is moderation. Uh, for me, as a central banker, it is to avoid the silent call of bankers. Whenever we're doing well, they come to me and say, why don't you borrow in this currency or that currency or some other currency? Everybody wants me to create a sovereign yield curve in dollars. And I tell them, we're borrowing today in rupees. Why would I want to create a sovereign yield curve in dollars when I have a rupee yield curve that you can, you can focus on? But the temptation is always to go out and borrow and borrow more in, in all kinds of currencies. These kinds of, uh, perhaps the, the, the biggest culprit in all this, I would argue, is, is the government. That when the government succumbs to the temptation of debt, whether it's through government borrowing or facilitating household borrowing, as a way of making today look a lot better than the future, that's when we get the really big problems. Uh, I've argued in my book, Fault Lines, that, that uh, part of the reasons for the subprime crisis was a, a strong encouragement from a variety of, of political figures in the United States uh, 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 for, for uh, poor households to borrow. It's a way of, of you know, making them feel better about uh, moderate income growth. So, uh, but, but that, that kind of argument has been picked up and taken elsewhere, but I think that's a concern, that when governments encourage borrowing, uh, I think it becomes particularly large, particularly systematic, particularly problematic. We have to be careful about that. So broadly, be careful, uh, and when it's big and huge, think about doing waivers, because uh, working it off is going to take a long time and create enormous political anxiety while you're doing that. Let me stop there.